between two workshops. So I will not be dragging on this discussion for long. I will come back and try to join later on. But one of the key things out of this is the scholarships, the scholarship that is being offered to one of students within the Caribbean region. And on this webinar today, the winner will be announced later on. And I do look forward to coming back at that point to join in the final or the ending of this presentation. So again, welcome to everyone. Hope you enjoy this series. And thank you for to the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation for approaching CARICOM and getting Cantor involved in this series. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And allow me please to acknowledge our honorable Minister Kirk Humphrey, who was, who was graciously served as our patron of this event. Sir, we welcome you again today and look forward to your announcement of the scholarship uh, recipient uh, later on in the program. Without further ado, allow me please to introduce our presenter, Senor Juan Carlos Cruston, president of the Caribbean Shipping Association. The CSA is a partner of the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation, and it is indeed an honor to welcome him here today. A little bit about his background, as I said, he's president of the CSA, uh, the governing body of uh, this incredible uh, trade group in the region. He's also Vice President Marketing and Corporate Affairs with Manzanillo International Terminal, past President of the Maritime Chamber of Panama, and member of the International Maritime Organization, MTCC Network's Global Stakeholder Committee. Mr. Croston was granted the Distinguished Alumni Award by the International Maritime University of Panama and was named by Lloyd's List in their Next Generation 2015 list of worldwide maritime leaders, the only one from, the Latin, from Latin America. He holds a BS degree in nautical engineering from the former Nautical School of Panama and a master's in maritime affairs from the World Maritime University in Sweden. It is my pleasure indeed to uh, welcome Juan to the program who will be presenting on Gangway to the World, uh, Caribbean Maritime Training Technology and Opportunities for Youth. Hi, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Yniv. And uh, thank you for, especially for the introduction of Senor Juan Carlos <laughs> Croston. <laughs> okay, so um, let me go with the... Uh, screen sharing. So I want to start, uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, talking about what the CSA or the Korean Shipping Association is about. Um, the Korean Shipping Association is the voice of the shipping industry in the Caribbean. We're turning 50 this year. Uh, you can see gray hair coming out now. <laughs> um, and uh, you can see we cut across uh, all the uh, sectors in the shipping industry. You can see uh, our depth. Also, we, uh, we attract both public and, and private sector organizations. So it, here, I want to remark how proud, how proud we are about the work that the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation is doing, and especially Dr. Brown Metzger, and how honored we are to be able to partner with them in the many educational activities they carry out. Thank you a lot for the invitation, Yunif. Uh, we're very proud of that. Um, so let's go on to the subject. We'll try to do something we would go from general to specific and from present tense trends to future trends. So the first thing is to remark how, how well our supply chain industry has done in, during all this pandemic. Uh, the, the fact is that 90%, 95% of the, the goods have been able to reach a destination and consumers. And, and most of the hiccups happen because of production and because not of transportation. And, you know, just think back on February, uh, if you will have been told as a student or as a, a business, 
person uh, that you have to be working remotely and you will have to transition to this virtual environment and everything will be fine. We have, see, we have said that there's no way we can do that. And the fact is that we did it. Uh, call it uh, resiliency planning or, or emergency uh, preparation or just plain luck. The fact is that our industry, all across the industry, we were able to transition uh, very quickly to this new environment. Okay, so the first thing that we will uh, examine is um, what's happening in, in logistics in general. And here I'm referencing a McKinsey and Company study. And in the title, you have the link to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the document in case you want to take a look at it. So the first thing is that the industry, the logistics industry have faced constant pressure to lower costs. And you can see the trends. Uh, this goes back to 1830s uh, to sea freight, but you can see that, that all, all over, uh, there's a, a regular downward trend of, of, on, on, on logistics costs. Um, this means that taking costs out of the system, the, it means being more efficient, doing more with less. And in shipping, uh, looking at this graph, we can see why. This is the average operating margin of the 17 biggest or largest container carriers in the world. And the, uh, the horizontal line means zero. So any dot above that line means that there was a positive operating margin for the container carriers. Any dot below means that there was a negative operating, operating margin. Uh, I think that before 2019, we can see that most of the dots were on the negative trend. So uh, the container carriers were losing money uh, by large since 2008 until 2018. So that was a decade of significant financial erosion for the container carriers. And that was in general throughout the logistics uh, industry. So that's why the, 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 uh, the firms were faced uh, or were pushed to continue cutting costs to be more efficient and to survive. Um, so the, um, the other thing is that um, the uh, document from McKinsey find out that 50 of the US largest importers still use spreadsheets to manage their international <laughs> supply chain. Yeah. So, you know, th there's these, uh, we talk about technology and efficiency and there's still a big gap between what it should be and what it is right now. Um, so that's why you see more and more of, of startups and, and funding to, be, uh, to help indus uh, industry and uh, firms be more efficient. So you can see that uh, you're talking about funding in logistics startups. Over the last years, we have seen a 76% compound annual growth rate from 2014. Uh, you know, even if you take out 18, which was an extraordinary year, uh, we can still see that we are coming from probably $400 million now to $6.3 billion in 2019. So there's a, a, a great deal of expectation from uh, the investors in our industry. They see our, our industry as ripe for uh, improvement in efficiencies. The other thing is that you can see the, uh, the comparison of logistic startup funding growth versus the overall venture, venture funding growth. So uh, whereas uh, the overall venture funding growth is growing at two and three times, our, the logistic startup funding growth is 14 and 17 times uh, what it was before. And most of the funding goes to last mile. What, you know, what we see as the delivery to our homes because now th this was pre for pandemic and, and we can expect that to be even more because we are going to consume more from home. Um, we also see a breakdown of the startup business model, last mile delivery, road freight, warehousing, air and ocean transportation, and you can see where the funding uh, ends up being. Um, the, I think that, that for our students in the region and for the uh, entrepreneurs, this is gold mine because they, they, they see now or they can see here where is the demand for uh, new apps and new technology that can improve the uh, uh, transportation industry. This is another way of looking at how the, uh, the breakdown between the traditional industry like transport and storage 
and tech is taking place in the funding. Um, so this is a, a graph that talks about um, the largest startups by country in Latin America and the Caribbean. So you can see that, for example, in the Caribbean, we have two, we have BIT out of Barbados, and uh, that company, its value between 100 and $200 million. And you have a company in Puerto Rico called Inmedata. Um, these companies range from healthcare to last mile to uh, a, a, a banking. But the, the, the fact is that there's also a need for that. I want to focus on one company specifically. It's called Rapi. Rapi is out of Colombia. And you can think of it like a, a Uber Eats or bought on steroids. In Rapi, it's, it's based out of Colombia, but they are, uh, they, 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 you can find them in Brazil, in Mexico, in Costa Rica. And the fact is, is that if you call Rapi, you can get pizza, you can get beer, you can even get a, a player if your basketball team or your chess player, the, the, your chess opponent walks out of the door uh, and you need a, a player to walk, you can call Rappi and Rappi will send you someone to play with you uh, a video game or a basketball pickup game. They are there to supply or to serve the market whatever the consumer needs. And they are valued at $3.5 billion. This is a company out of Colombia. So, we can see that the, the, the need for these uh, type of, of, of companies. Okay, so this is logistics. Now we'll go to shipping. Uh, shipping, we don't see it, but shipping is through, going through a huge transformation and it has nothing to do with COVID. Um, there are two things playing out right now. One, it's the, um, the, the, the evolution on, on uh, how the, the, the power of the chips and also technology. Again, this is another uh, document. You can see it's from Dr. Mark Martin Stopford called the three scenarios. And first he puts into perspective the, uh, our crisis, the coronavirus crisis and the pandemic compared to crisis going back to the 1970s. So yes, this is going to be a big crisis, but our industry has gone through this throughout this year. So uh, uh, the debt might be a little bigger, but our industry is used to this. Um, the second thing is that um, the, the transformation, you know, we don't see it. The last time this happened in our industry was back in 1870s when the chips went from coal to fuel. Uh, I don't plan to be around in 150 years, so I might uh, as well enjoy this, this, this uh, 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 road. Uh, we'll soon have more environmental friendly chips, ocean going chips with embedded technology that will make it far more efficient. And look that I'm not saying that we're going to have electric vessels or unmanned vessels because we don't know that. What we don't, we know is that there's a push for better, more environmental friendly technology uh, and fuel and power and technology that will make the chip more efficient. Uh, the first thing is about fuel uh, and, and power. You see the IMO strategy on the reduction of ground greenhouse uh, gases emissions from ships. Uh, in 2018, they adopted this uh, strategy. And basically it says that by 2030, the uh, it mandates an average 40% reduction on CO2 emissions per transport work compared to 2008 levels. And by 2050, a 50% reduction on overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, now, the details are not ironed out yet. By 2023, you can see there require, there's a requirement to finalize the short-term measures to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, but this is already moving. And you know, you see 2050 and say, ah, don't worry, uh, you know, that's down the road. The fact is that by, you know, if we want to have uh, 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 zero emissions shipping industry or 50% reduction by 2050, and taking into consideration that the chips has a, a 25 average life cycle, the first chips with the new technologies have to be on the water by 2030. We're talking about 10 years. And if uh, if we take into consideration the buildup, it's about two years, then in 2028, the first 
2028, the first vessel uh, order uh, with new technology, power technology has to be made. So success uh, in going green will require all stakeholders, owners, yards, equipment manufacturers, class societies, governments, charters, flag states, entrepreneurs, all of them have to work aligned on this. Uh, there's gonna be hybrid solutions uh, and you're gonna have, because you're going to, from carbon reduction to carbon neutral to zero emissions. And you have, uh, you have basically three paths. You have uh, the path of light gas and that goes from LNG to ammonia. Uh, you have the heavy gas or alcohol that goes from LPG and methanol to hydrogen and you have the biofuels or synthetic fuels. So all of this is being combined to see what's the best. And most of the development have to happen on shore. 80 to 90% of the uh, approximate $7 trillion investment needed for this is gonna come from ashore. Um, and we're gonna have four levers. We have alternate fuels that we talk about, technology improvements, operational efficiency, and policy. And you can see here what's the expectations of the, uh, the, the, when the new chips or chips with this new technology will hit the waves. So this is only on power propulsion. Then we are talking about technology and to be more efficient. So you can see all of the areas only on board the vessel where technology can have a big impact to be more efficient. Propulsion, auxiliary power, auxiliary machinery, ballast, IT and communication, current handling. You, you can read it, um, you know, all of this. Yeah. And, you know, we, we compare ourselves to the airline industry. Uh, uh, airplane transmit about two gigabytes of data per day uh, to uh, command stations. A chip transmit about 200, uh, 200 uh, uh, megabytes. So there's a huge gap between what uh, our uh, ocean going chips should be transmitting to you know, avoid uh, breakdowns and preventive maintenance and, and operational efficiency and so on. And this is only on chips. Then you go on a chart and you can see the organization of the company, how it can be affected by technology with uh, technical teams, customer with cargo systems, ship builders, transport factory, all over. And the organization needs to include this to be more efficient, to handle the ship that is going to be also more efficient. So if there is any doubt about the role of technology in our lives, I brought you a very short video. I want you to watch and listen on how technology uh, influences our lives and captures our data. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to Let's see. But when we set up our phones, so we wanted to no sound. We are actually hearing it one. So okay, 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 okay. Let it go. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to it when we set up our phones. So we wanted to figure out what exactly Google is learning about us throughout the day. So here's what we're going to do. We have two identical phones. The only difference between these two phones is this one is in airplane mode. Both of the phones lack a SIM card, and they haven't been set up to access any Wi-Fi networks. So for all intents and purposes, these phones have no connection to a data network. We're going to keep them with us throughout the day. And while I travel around D.C., we're going to figure out just what Google is finding out about me. Our first stop, Sims Convenience Store, just outside our Fox Bureau, for a quick coffee. From there, we took a walk to the Capitol and took a quick walk around the Senate office buildings and then decided to hop in a car and head around town. Hello. We're going to the Children's Hospital, please. To run our test, we had to do more than walk the block, so we took a tour around our nation's capital. First, due north to the Children's National Medical Center Hospital, then west to St. Albans School and the National Cathedral. Our tour around town was a 14-mile journey that lasted more than an hour. The entire time, the phones had no access to the internet. Oh my goodness. Not a Wi-Fi connection and not any cellular data service. It almost seemed quaint to assume that Google wouldn't even be able to collect data on me. Let's head back to the bureau, my friend. Oh, 
That church is beautiful. Google's business model is simple. Collect data on its users and then use that data to sell targeted ads. It's a business model called surveillance capitalism. But does that critical data collection work even when your phones aren't connected? So we're back here at our Fox Bureau in DC and we've got both of our phones exactly how we left with them. The only difference really, I snapped a couple of bad selfies at the National Cathedral. <laughs> but otherwise they have stayed in my pocket for the entire day. So let's find out what they know. This is our man in the middle device. It's basically a Wi-Fi network that these phones are gonna to connect to once we turn their Wi-Fi on. It's going to pass data through it on the way to Google, but on the way, we're actually gonna get a copy of the same data that Google's gonna get. We'll be able to decrypt it and then find out where we've been throughout the day. Within minutes, the numbers rolled in. The phone that wasn't on airplane mode registered more than 100 locations, 130 activities, and even 152 barometric readings. As soon as it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, it transmitted 300 kilobytes of data straight to Google. The phone even logged our exact locations, tracking us all around town, the Capitol, the hospital, the school, and the cathedral. Now you may notice what's missing here is the exact route that we took, but it got that data too. It knows when I got out of the car. The metadata has a time log down to the very second, tracking everything when they think that you're walking, riding, and yes, even getting out of the car. Okay, so you're thinking, this isn't a big deal. I'll just put my phone in airplane mode. Yeah, we thought of that too. This is the other phone that we had with us that no SIM card also remained in airplane mode the entire time. Let's see what kind of data it captured. The phone with airplane mode activated actually logged more locations and activities than the other phone, and it also transferred hundreds of kilobytes of data to Google as soon as it was activated. The only thing that's missing from this map is our stop at the Children's Hospital, but it still knows we were there. There it is, exiting vehicle, 100% accuracy, through complicated user agreements and free software, Google gets users to sign away their privacy for nothing. They're even following you in the places that most people would expect total privacy. Government buildings, a children's hospital, a private school, a church. Every move you make, every step you take, Google is watching you. Okay, so I know that most of you now will go to internet and try to disable that from Google. Uh, uh, I'm going only to take about 10 more minutes of the presentation, so just do that after I finish the presentation, but there is more to it. Now, my question is, why if there's the companies have so much data about us, we don't have enough data about chips? So those, those are the gaps that we need to close with technology, okay? So going to the last leg of the presentation, we're going to talk about the uh, future trends. And uh, you can see, again, uh, another document, and this is one from DHL, uh, Trend Research. Um, and you can see all the, the dots of new trends that they see from technology and social and business uh, uh, trends that are going to impact logistics down the road. Um, I want to focus on only on a, on a few ones. The first one is uh, the future of work. And I think this is relevant for the students uh, listening and the business owners and the businessmen talking. Uh, you know, the, the idea is to create a, a better business environment for the employees to uh, to interact, and one of them is automation. And you know, we always have this tendency to think that automation means uh, losing jobs for humans to give it to robots. But this uh, study suggests that uh, the uh, 75 million jobs replaced by automation are going to generate 133 million new jobs. Uh, and I'll give you a very good example. Uh, this is a uh, uh, a video of uh, the container yard in the port I work. And you can see the, uh, the crane on the foreground uh, has no cabin compared, white cabin compared to the uh, cranes on the background. That means that's because this crane works remotely automatically. I call it a robot disguised as a crane. 98% uh, of the transactions uh, that crane carries out uh, it's no human interaction whatsoever. Uh, the crane talks to the system, uh, gets information, uh, locates a, a, a trucker, and he dispatches the container automatically. So no interaction. Yes, there's no, no driver now on the crane, but we need two or three technicians, good technicians that know about software and technology to keep the crane operating. So that's the evolution of the jobs as we see it. Um, we also have um, 
uh, marketplaces. This, they say here that on average, trucks uh, in developed uh, economies uh, go 70, 25% uh, empty. I'll say that in our countries, this is more like 50%. So there's a huge need for uh, technology to close this gap and be more efficient. Remember, the, the work here is efficiency. So you're going to have price transparency, real-time quoting, uh, flexible sourcing of external operate services. Of course, you're going to have uh, uh, challenges. You're going to have data security. You're going to have insurance, liability, guaranteeing of service quality because you're outsourcing this to other uh, uh, people. But the, thing, the, the, the main thing is that you can imagine Uber. You know, in the old days, taxis were driving around looking for customers. They don't know where they are, but they're driving, they're driving, they're driving. Probably 50% of the time they're driving, they're driving empty. With Uber, the driver knows exactly where the next customer is and he picks up and that closes the gap of the uh, time he's driving empty. So that makes him more efficient because he's carrying driver, uh, passengers and he's creating revenue more often than if not. Uh, you can argue whether Uber and the contract with the drivers, but the fact is that the technology is enabled the driver to become more efficient. Uh, this is another trend. Uh, then you have uh, mass customization. Uh, what does this mean? That you have uh, the ability to produce things that go uh, personalized. And you can see on the right, for example, the uh, face mask. Now you see oh, everybody trying to customize these. Um, on the left, you have a machine that prints and, 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 and packages pills that you need each day. So you don't need to have five or six bottles of pills uh, to take up. Now you have these machines that mixes the pills and he prints out when you are gonna have to buy it by Saturday, you're gonna take an aspirin and blah, 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 blah. And with the uh, uh, population becoming older, this has an appeal for that. Of course, you need the, uh, you have the challenges. You wanna have uh, reasonable production and data security again, a higher service le uh, requirement levels, uh, but there's also a market for that. Then you have space logistics. Yes, you're gonna need logistics in space. In space. And I was also amazed to see there's a satellite to launch satellites, like you see in the picture. Um, so, you know, all the things that you can expect in that place, um, but there is a market for that too. And you're gonna need technology and people to carry that out. Then you have artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know if you, see on, you saw on the news, but the, the picture on the left is uh, Whole Foods, a uh, US-based uh, supermarket chain. And in those supermarkets owned by Amazon, you don't have cash, cash registers. They are out. So you don't, make, you, you don't have to queue to pay. The, you see on the roof of that picture, you have uh, black boxes. These are cameras. So you enter into the supermarket and you're putting stuff in your, in your car or, or your bag. The cameras are following you around and they're picking up whatever you're putting in your bag or your car. When you walk out, they produce a, a receipt. And before you get home, you already have the receipt in your in, in, in your inbox or your, your account and it's debited from your credit card. So like that, there are thousands of ways that we can improve customer experience uh, for that. You can reduce costs. Uh, of course, this entails a lot of capital costs and ethical concerns. So, um, but there, there's also uh, this market for that. Um, opportunities. Drury, in a study in 2018, they estimated that freight generates around the shipping of 200 odd million containers per year produces about 1.3 billion freight invoices. Uh, because of cost of credit, transaction cost, cost of that debt, they estimate that these 1.3 billion freight invoices create about 34 billion dollars in inefficiencies. If there's someone here listening to this that goes and creates a system or an app or technology that can, that can solve this, that person will not have to work for the rest of its life. It will have used to sit down and watch Netflix or something like that because this is $34 billion that the shipping industry is waiting to be sold. Another opportunity, um, when this container is cheap, uh, there's, there, there are certain documents that need to be produced. 
and they need to be cheap from the seller to the buyer. Uh, most, if not all of these documents go, go on by airline. So the shipping industry spends $8 billion a year shipping physical documents to the, set, to the buyers. So if the industry can uh, adopt electronic bill of lading, they estimate by 50%, they estimate that the savings will be $4 billion per year. $4 billion per year only by going from physical papers to digital papers. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to talk is about, of course, cybersecurity. All of this technology is gonna create uh, uh, backdoors and opportunities for uh, bad people to exploit. And we can see that, that over the last three years, four, the four largest container lines have also offered cyber attacks. Uh, the latest was CMACGM. So uh, experts have warned that the industry will receive further attacks. And the idea is to also create contingencies for the companies and also uh, strengthen the security of uh, the, uh, the IT systems in the companies. Okay, so you say, okay, so I'm studying to, for the students, I'm studying to be a CIFR. What has, has anything to do with me? So this needs people. And I have to uh, make three remarks here. The first one, yes, this is me back in 1999. Two, yes, I did my own hair because, you know, hair, uh, hair cutting was expensive back then. And three, I was not fat. It was just the wind blowing and, and, and the shirt, but I was not fat, just, just to make that remark. I, I am also a seafarer. Uh, I had to evolve. Uh, when I came out of uh, working on board vessels, I, 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 I'm now in, in, in doing commercial. I never went to, to university to study commercial or marketing and stuff like that. I'm doing that. Uh, we have to evolve. So even though we study, I think that being a seafarer gives me a unique perspective of the industry. I would say that there are not enough seafarers working in companies in decision-making uh, positions uh, to give a good perspective. I also say that all of this technology and implementation needs people. So um, we need uh, the young people to start thinking critically about our industry, understanding the industry first, then to apply critical thinking to solve the problems that probably we give for granted because we have been in the industry for too long. And last but not least, um, I'll say, uh, let's not forget our seafarers. Uh, we still have a big crisis in our hand with seafarers unable to come ashore and, and seafarers ashore not being able to go on board. Uh, and we have to continue putting pressure on governments to make sure that this is resolved as soon as possible because these guys make possible that we get all our goods uh, on time in our supermarkets. With that, I finish. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos. I was very much looking forward to your presentation, but you've blown my mind. Uh, this is remarkable. Uh, the questions are just flowing back and forth. And uh, let me invite now Pierre, our young junior Caribbean ambassador. Uh, he's actually the leader of government business Barbados National Youth Parliament to um, manage the Q&A. Pierre. Good. Good morning, Mr. Crosstown. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I must say this was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I think the information provided um, was critical. I think it answered most of the questions we had floating in our heads. Um, so thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, presentation. We do still have a bit of questions for you, um, just to get a better idea of how this can benefit the Caribbean region. And I think our port of departure will be just what we've all been developing from and working with um, in the last couple of months. And that's the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we know that this has impacted um, your sector as well. You mentioned it in your presentation, but um, our question is, have you seen or is there a demand for certain types of maritime jobs resulting from the pandemic and its impact on shipping and transport? Well, first we have to uh, take into consideration that shipping industry was always considered a vital industry, so it never stopped. And locally for uh, most of the people working on shipping and in logistics in general, we uh, didn't have to be for load or, or, or lose jobs. So it has 
given uh, job certainty to the people already in the industry. Um, I'll say that now more than ever, people will see the need for uh, reliable transportation uh, and not only transportation to the supermarket so you go can go and pick up your stuff, uh, transportation certainty so you can be at your home and wait for the delivery man to come with your stuff at your home. So I think that that's where the, uh, the gaps are gonna be because we have proven to be very good to supply to uh, places where people come and, and get their stuff. Now that last mile logistics, the ones, uh, the, the, uh, the, the part that we're, I was talking in the McKinsey study, where it says that most of the funding for startups is going, is that, and Rappi, again, the, the Colombian company, Uber Eats, Globo, all of these companies uh, across uh, Latin America and the Caribbean are a good example. They, they want to exploit that need to go to where the consumer is and not wait for the consumer to come to where the goods are. Okay, so I'm getting the sense that this is a very good time for development, is a very good time for investment, and especially for regions like the Caribbean to tap into this industry. Um, and in looking at the context of these calls and these sessions we've been having, particularly because we're focusing on youth and how they can or how we can get involved in the sector, um, how do you think educators in the Caribbean region or maybe governments can help to support young persons or support Caribbean nationals um, to be employed within the international shipping and logistics companies? How can they help to prepare young people? How, they can, how can they give us the tools in order to develop ourselves so that we can function or be a part of that industry? Well, I'll say that governments have a part to play, but I'll say the private sector has uh, even, even in, uh, 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 it's as important hand to play in this uh, because uh, the funding that you see, for example, going on, on, on technology and last mile that we talked before in the presentation is coming from the private sector. So the government, what it needs to do, uh, it's create the framework for these companies and these venture capitalists to come to the region and invest. And, and you know, $3.5 billion uh, uh, price or, or valuation for this Colombian company is a good example. The, the investor feel comfortable and secure in going to a Colombia and invest $3.5 billion in a company that is doing delivery to, to the home and is bringing you a chess player or a basketball player or a video game or something like that. So uh, I would say that the, the, the government needs to create the framework for venture capitalists to be comfortable coming to our countries and invest, where it's $100,000 or $3 billion. And then our uh, private sector needs to be more agile. You know, we, we need to, you usually, if you ask me, I'll say, well, we cannot solve this, but that's why we need you uh, to be critical of what we do in the industry and say, I think we can solve this. And like they used to say before, there's an app for that. Uh, you know, th there's something that, that technology can help bridge. Uh, so, and, and we need to be open to new ideas coming from, from everybody to be implemented and tried. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I mean, you mentioned very importantly, having that framework in order for this type of investment or this business to occur. And my, immediately my, my brain goes to, I'm also a law student, so my brain goes to that legislative type framework. So when we're having conversations about um, the shipping industry and these new technologies that we're developing, um, you also mentioned the possibility of cyber crimes. And then even if providing that framework so that companies feel comfortable investing or doing business with the Caribbean, what type of, of um, system do you think governments need to prepare, whether it's legislative or even just to secure persons with their cyber privacy? What systems do you think we need to put in place specifically to prepare um, Caribbean regions for this type of investment? Well, we, we don't need to invent the, the wheel uh, because there are other countries that we can emulate. So we can look at the uh, legislation that they have in place, of course, with uh, Caribbean flavor, but um, we, we need to look at, at, at what the other countries that are attracting more foreign direct investment, uh, what are they doing to bring to our national legislation. And take into consideration that now, you know, with the uh, government coffers 
uh, being drained because of, of lack of revenue on one side and, and, and fighting COVID on the other side, I think that the governments will be much more receptive in uh, uh, trying to adapt legislation so they can attract more foreign direct investment. We need that in the region. We need uh, investors uh, and, and funds to fund this to create a more even uh, level playing field uh, regarding finance in the region. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wish we had more time for the questions, but we've just run almost to the end of it. And, and I'm thankful, I'm happy to see this development, the technology within the system. It's very, very, very exciting for me as a young person to see the type of developments you guys have within this industry. Um, and I'm happy to see that even in the Caribbean, we've been having more and more conversations about how we can develop the maritime industry. I mean, the sessions that we've, have, we've been having over the couple of months have shown our commitment to ensuring that young persons have a part to play and have the opportunities to get into this industry. So thank you for your presentation. And uh, we look forward to these opportunities for Caribbean youth um, and Caribbean nationals to be a part of it. Thank, thank you, Pierre. Thank you once again, uh, Juan Carlos. And now uh, we are going to be making the announcement of our scholarship winner and so honored to invite the minister, Minister Humphrey, uh, to make that announcement and presentation. Is the minister here, Laurette? Yes, he's here. He's on. He just needs to unmute his mic and turn on his mic. Minister, you're muted. Uh, thank you very, very much to all. Uh, first of all, before I do, let me just say how uh, thrilling that presentation just was, actually. I found it a very enlightening one. And I would wish to invite you to make a presentation to my ministry at some point in the very near future, if you would be open to that idea. Certainly. Um, I also want to thank all of the persons who participated in the webinars over the last few weeks and all of the wonderful students who, who were part of it. But in the end, only one person could receive the scholarship. And I would like to announce that Ms. Elisa Gobin Singh is the winner of the scholarship this year, and she deserves all the accolades and a virtual round of applause for her fantastic work. So our winner is Elisa Gobin Singh. Go. <laughs> Alyssa, would you make some remarks? Um, I would just like to say that I feel honored and extremely grateful. Like I can't put into words how, how blessed I feel for being selected for the scholarship. You know, it, it, was, it wasn't just me, it was a group effort, my entire family, you know, when I, when I first saw the offer, I, I went to my granny. Everything is my granny. She's eight, she turned 90. And I always tell her, you know, granny, I got the offer. She was the first person I told when I wanted to go into the maritime industry. I said, granny, I got, I got an email today. And they said that I have a chance for applying for the scholarship. I said, I am praying on my end. But I would just like you to, to, you know, put those words forward. And I just feel honored and blessed. Thank you so much. Well, on behalf of the um, American Caribbean Maritime Foundation and the Caribbean Association for Training, for national training uh, agencies, it is our pleasure indeed. I should have mentioned that you are already enrolled at the University of Trinidad and Tobago in the Center for Maritime and Ocean Studies where you're uh, pursuing a bachelor's in nautical science and maritime operations. And uh, it is really quite remarkable. We received really only eight applicants uh, and only one from Trinidad. And uh, it is amazing. Uh, the University of Trinidad and Tobago is an academic partner, is one of our three academic partners. The other two are the Caribbean Maritime University in Jamaica 
and the LJN Maritime Academy in, in, in Bahamas. And so this will be a real asset uh, to us and an opportunity, I hope, for you to pursue your uh, studies. We'll be awarding you a full scholarship tuition and uh, with sending you off with, with our blessings. Thank you very much for being here today. Not and a thank problem, you. thank you. And thank you very much, Minister, for doing the honors indeed. Now to uh, close out the program, if I could ask you, please, Minister, to provide our closing remarks. Uh, thank you again. And again, let me just say a very special congratulations to you, Lisa, uh, for a job well done. And to all the organizers of this amazing webinar, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve as your patron. And indeed, all of us, regardless of our positions, are in positions where we could actually learn a lot. And I've learned a lot over the last few weeks. Uh, above most, I think I've learned that we need to work together in the region if we're going to be able to overcome some of these challenges that we face. You know, I, I had a whole speech, but as I listened this morning, I just made some different notes because, mm -hmm. you know, you have to move as the spirit moves you. Mm -hmm. And it is my thinking this morning, I just reflected on you know, all of our history. You know, the Native Americans, when they were here in the Caribbean, and the capacity to move across the sea and even set up a whole local governance structure using the sea. I think of when we were discovered in Barbados in 1536, in Jamaica and, and Trinidad by Columbus in 1494 and 98. And, and just our history is so strong that most of us who came here, though we came against our will, found ourselves developing a much more personal relationship with the sea to the extent that it is so embedded into our DNA now that the ocean has become a very important part of who we are. And, and, and for us, and the sea remains still the way we move goods and services across the world. It is still the most important way and most efficient way to move goods and services across the world. And many would have seen that during COVID, uh, as one just said rightfully, shipping still continued to happen because we recognize that for people to get essential goods and services, we still need to be able to use the ocean. And I think in a sense, what I would do for those of us who choose this as an opportunity to make our, our living and to make our contribution is that hopefully it, it clarifies in the minds of others the important role for those of us who have maritime as our future and as our careers. I think is for us in Barbados, we took a decision during COVID um, unlike some other countries, that we would allow people to move. So we, as you know, we had allowed the cruise ships to come. We had allowed passengers to disembark. At a time, people were very fearful of COVID. Uh, we just felt it was the right thing to do, the humane thing to do, recognizing that there are Barbadians and Caribbean people on ships all over the world, and we would like people to do the same for us. And so our first step in going forward is recognizing that this is a human enterprise. And even as we become more technologically advanced, it's still a human enterprise. And we must treat to it with a certain degree of humanity as well. I, I support the move now as we're saying more and more regulation. I'm not the quintessential bureaucrat, but I do think that there is a need for more regulation. And we're seeing more and more regulation. And why? Because we want to ensure maritime safety, maritime security. We want to ensure environmental protection. These things are going to be very important going forward. Barbados and the Caribbean, but specifically in Barbados, we're now looking at ensuring we have robust 21st century legislation. And it's going to be important. When we were audited by the IMO in Barbados um, two years ago, there were 23 areas of concern. A lot of it was rooted in the fact that we did not have the legislation up to standard. And so we're now working on bringing our legislation up to standard. And I think this is going to be important. And essentially, I think we all have to move to a safer ocean. We need to have safer ships. We need to make sure we move, uh, we reduce our carbon footprint. In so doing, we have to make sure we watch the way we dispose of our waste when the ships come in. Um, it, it's just going to be very, very important. Sustainability is going to be the way forward, you know. It used to be a, sh a, a television show, no movie, Back to the Future. And it's kind of where we are. We have to go back if we're going to go forward. We have to discover much more sustainable ways of doing things. We have to discover much more sustainable ways of treating to the ocean. I, I listened to one, uh, one Carlos's presentation about some of these emerging jobs um, as we go forward. I, I think even though in some cases, one, we're not sure, for example, in the, the area you raised in relation to 
uh, those autonomous ships, I think we still have to prepare. Uh, the Caribbean must prepare. I think if we're going to get ahead of the curve, we have to prepare for the jobs to come. Uh, and therefore, I, 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 I am imagining that the Caribbean and Barbados could look at itself in a way as being the hub for some of these remote centers that will be controlling these autonomous ships uh, as we think about the direction in which the, the world is going. You know, when people ask me what are the jobs in my time, I always say your first job, your most important job is to take care of the ocean. That is your first job. And you have to develop a love for it. You have to take care of it because this is the way, it, the only way that it's going to be in the position then to take care of you. And of course, when I'm not being philosophical, I then refer to all these emerging jobs that Juan Carlos spoke of. And I would like the opportunity really for us to have a conversation and expand on some of those jobs and expand that conversation because I feel that this is a this is a transformative industry. I have said to my staff in the ministry that shipping maritime is the way of the future. There is no other way. Yep. The way, the, the, the way that the Caribbean is going to make it a name for itself, I believe now, is also in maritime. And, and the reason is because we have so much distance that we can make up. But if you look at where we're located, perfectly located to be to be that place and to be that space and we must see this as a regional initiative and not necessarily as an island-based initiative if we try to if we are to make the most of this and then lastly i think also it's important that we get our training right that is why i find this program so exciting i want to thank the american um, caribbean maritime university i want to thank canta the caribbean youth ambassadors the caribbean maritime university all the various training institutions tvet here in barbados sjpa here in Barbados, all of the institutions that are doing work to make this a reality as we move forward. And I want to thank, again, as I close, all of the organizers. Mm -hmm. I, I think it has been an excellent series. Uh, I think it has also elevated the role of, of the maritime sector in the minds of people. I think if I could give young people any advice is that it really doesn't matter what sector you choose. You have to apply yourself. You have to want it. You have to read. You have to constantly retool yourself. And I close by saying what Juan Carlos said, you know, the, the industry is evolving and as a people, we have to evolve as well. So congratulations again to our winner, congratulations to the organizers and thank you all very much. Minister, the thank, thanks are ours, sir, very much. And while you, we are, you're in the invitation mood, Minister, I would like you please, if you would honor me by being a guest on my podcast, Diplomatically Speaking, to talk about this very subject which you have so passionately spoken of in the last few minutes. Thank you, my honor to do so. Uh, Juan Carlos was actually my guest uh, on uh, as well as, um, and we recently had the Deputy Speaker of the House in Jamaica. We are queuing up the Prime Minister as well. So, sir, I would be most honored if you would join that those that those that rank and 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 honor us with your expertise and your presence. Thank you so very much, my honor. To do so. All right, so we are at the end of our program, and um, I am seeing that. Allison, uh, uh, we're going to have Pauline, the Pauline, the chair of Canter. So that's right. Thank you, Miss Pauline Whiteman, our partner, actually, chair of Canter, to move the vote of thanks. Good morning, everyone, and it really is indeed a pleasure to more or less bring the curtain down on this extremely insightful, interesting webinar series. And first of all, I'd like to thank our patron, the Honorable Kirk Humphrey, um, for your insights and um, for being with us throughout this, this webinar series. And I would like to thank Dr. Geneve Brown Metzger. She has been extremely, extremely supportive. And Cantor sincerely thanks you for all of the effort and for ensuring that this webinar series comes off, came off so successfully. So thank you, Dr. Bra Dr. Geneve. Uh, I would also like to say special, a special thank you to Alyssa, our scholarship winner. Congratulations. And I truly wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And I hope to that you succeed in every in every way so that you will be able to serve the the maritime sector 
in 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 a very you know dynamic way. Um, today's webinar, I I wish to thank Juan Carlos for that dynamic presentation. Um, re re it was really really interesting, and um, you had all of us in, in I mean at, in very attentive mode. Um, so thank you again, and I realized that um, you would have made created waves. So in the future, we expect that you would be uh, hosting several other webinars. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Juan Carlos. I would also like to thank Dr. Courtney Thompson for opening this morning. Um, Dr. Thompson, if you're still here, thank you very much. And um, the youth ambassador, uh, uh, I, I wish to thank you for fielding those questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I haven't left anyone out, but just to let, um, let you know, I wish to uh, convey a special thank you to Dr. Bristol. Uh, for participating, for um, collaborating with us, Dr. Bristol from CARICOM. And it will be remiss of me if I do not mention Miss Pat McPherson, who would have been here at the inception. And she has, has gone off on pre-retirement leave, but I really sincerely would like to thank her for uh, her participation in the first instance and for providing yeoman service within CARICOM. Thank you so much, Ms. McPherson. Um, I also would like to sincerely thank ACMF and the CARICOM Youth Am Ambassadors. ACMF, the American Car Caribbean Maritime Foundation, thank you so much for this, um, for partnering, partnering with Cantor to host this extremely um, well-timed initiative. And we really, we really, really appreciate um, partnering your, your uh, efforts and partnering with us. And we really look forward to future endeavors with ACMF. Thank you so much. And finally, if I may, there was a working group that was charged with ensuring that this Web in this, this webinar series came off smoothly. And um, I would like to thank members of that working group. And I know they have would have been meeting regularly and working assiduously to ensure the success of this historical initiative. So with that, I hope I have not left out anyone, all the past presenters. Um, we convey sincere thanks to them. And um, thank you, students. Thank you. Um, thanks to the audience, uh, persons who would have joined, because this was really for you. So thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Whiteman. Laurette, Pat, the working team, hats off to you, would not have happened were it not for your navigating uh, to draw on a maritime um, phrase. So really, we appreciate it from our hearts to yours. Walk good, everybody, and God bless. Same to you. Have a nice day. Bye. Okay. God bless, everybody. Bye.